Namaskar and welcome back to this series of lectures on principles of construction management. And we are now at the last lecture having gone through 39 meetings. So today is the last in this series and we would like to first recapitulate what we did and then try to look at a few things which we could not do. At least when I look back, I thought that there are things that we could probably have added. Some of those things we will try to address today and with that we will close the discussion on our module. So recapitulating what we did, we opened the discussion with a general discussion on defining stakeholders, emphasizing the multidisciplinary nature of modern construction. We went through the exercise of the tendering process, the resources which are useful or the resources which are used as far as construction industry is concerned, time, manpower, equipment, money of course. Then we went on to do estimation of quantities using drawings. To that extent, using drawings to find out quantities gave us some insight into the different items of work which are involved. Of course, we did a very simple example of a boundary wall, but then we had an example of a pipe rack as far as the homework is concerned. And if you have gone through some literature, you would have found so many other examples where if you do the estimation properly, you get an insight into the different items, the specific details. If you read the BOQs or the schedule of rates, you find how those items have to be written and so on. From there, we moved on to construction economics. We learnt of topics like the net present value or the IRR running account bills and so on. We went on to have a detailed discussion on planning and scheduling. We learnt about CPM, PERT, the optimistic time, the pessimistic time, the likely time and so on. Then we learnt how to identify critical activities and critical path, floats, crashing of networks, resource levelling and resource allocation. So that gave us an insight into how we can try to reduce the duration of the project, why we need to reduce the duration of the project. Is it always a disadvantage if the short term cost goes up? Because in the long term, if we include the indirect costs, we might actually get a saving if we reschedule or allocate additional resources to certain activities. Those were some of the exercises that we did as far as planning and scheduling is concerned. Then we went on to discuss construction safety. We talked about unsafe action conditions, we talked about PPE, the cost of safety, the role of a safety officer, accidents, how to prevent accidents, what are the steps that companies need to take to prevent accidents and so on, followed by a discussion on quality. Now rather than getting into a very detailed discussion on the statistics of quality control or the total quality management and so on, what we did was we took up specific examples like gas pressure welding, concrete work, welding, grouting and so on and try to understand the relevant issues as far as quality control is concerned and identify those issues from the process. And that is something which is very, very important as far as a construction manager is concerned because very often you are faced with situations where there may be no quality control procedure already available and you may have to create one. For that, you must be able to create or identify the kind of items which require special attention after understanding the process. In fact, in the last lecture, we did precisely that when we went through the example of laying a concrete sewer pipeline. So, beginning with the quality control issues at the plant where the pipes are manufactured, which would include the material being used, the equipment being used there and so on, to the quality assurance programs of the pipes which have been manufactured to conditions including the carriage of those pipes and finally the installation issues including excavation, backfilling, 
jointing and so on and so forth. So, we must understand that quality is a very, very important and in fact, a very critical parameter as far as construction is concerned. And finally, we spend some time talking about legal issues, for example, contract, good contract, dispute resolution, some interesting terminology and so on. So, what we try to do as far as this course is concerned is to emphasize a couple of topics, especially safety, quality, legal issues, which are often not really covered in traditional courses as far as construction management is concerned. So, we did touch upon issues like planning and scheduling, construction economics and estimation, which are often covered to some extent, but I try to also emphasize the importance and the relevance and the interfacial links of safety, quality and legal issues and integrated them in this series of lectures with different modules. So, now having done or having recapitulated what we did, now let me try to spend some time on what we could not do. The first thing that I would have wished we could do, but we could not do because of paucity of time, was bidding from the point of view of a contractor including things like markup, overheads and so on. We did talk about it a little bit off and on when we were talking about the rates and so on, but I would have liked to spend some more time on that. But now that is something which I will have to leave to you as a home assignment which you may do at your own free time. We will spend some time today also on that. Then there was this different issue of managerial economics which I wish to cover, but I have to leave out because very often you are faced with the challenge of evaluating the financial strength of a company versus another company and then there are certain documents that are brought to you and you have to interpret them. So, I would have liked to take up some of those examples and, and try to go through those examples with you which I could not do. Subcontractor management is another thing which I would have liked to do and we will talk about it briefly today. Relevant provisions in the Building and Other Construction Workers Act and some of the legal provisions as far as construction laws are concerned and finally, computer applications and construction management. So, these are some of the things which got left out when we tried to pick up more relevant topics without which we could not have done justice to some of these topics. So, today what we will do is to try to take up some of these issues and briefly touch upon them and of course, the final treatment I will have to leave to you. So, coming to the first of those items in the wish list that we could not complete is the issue of looking at arriving at a rate from a contractor's perspective. Now, what we have done in this course is that we have repeatedly emphasized that the cost estimates are based on standard rates such as DSR, whether it is excavation or brickwork or concrete or shuttering or reinforcement work or whatever. As far as those rates are concerned, we have said that they are or they could be based or arrived at using standard rates such as DSR. Now, this DSR or the Delhi schedule of rates or any such standard that we have, this would look at it from the perspective that the rate is made up of material, labor and equipment component and gives only a certain fixed percentage perhaps for overheads and profits. We must understand and remember that at the end of it, the contractor is looking at the project from a slightly different perspective and that is where things like a markup comes in. The estimate of the cost for any item from a bidder's perspective depends on factors that include other issues than the material, labor and equipment component and one of them is the markup. And now what is a markup? It is the sum of profit, contingency, allowances for risk and general overheads and can be expressed in terms of some percentage of the total cost in terms of some percentage of the bid price. What I mean to say here is the following. Suppose we have two items, let us say excavation and brickwork. Now, the DSR rate for excavation is let us say 100, for brickwork it is 150, whatever the units are. Now, this DSR rate is a standard rate. When the contractor looks at it, there is an actual expenditure which will be involved in excavation, let us say it is 80 and brickwork it is 125. Now, will the contractor bid 80 and 125? No. 
what the contractor will try to do is that it will have to add some profit, some allowance for contingency and risk and so on as we will see in the subsequent slides and may bid at 110 or it may bid at 90 or sometimes bid at even 70. Similarly, for brick work the contractor may bid at 140, he may bid at 160 or whatever it is depending on by what percentage the contractor wants to up this actual cost. So, this actual cost is upped by what can we call a markup. So, this markup can be a certain percentage. Somebody can have a decision at the corporate level of that company that let us have a markup of 20 percent on the actual cost. So, if it is a markup of 20 percent on 80, we get this rate to be 96. Subsequently, and of course, we can arrive at quoted rate for the brickwork as well if the markup was kept at the same 20 percent. But there is no reason for the contractor to have a uniform markup. The, the markup could be different for different items. So, these are the kind of things which I would have liked to talk to you about sometime, but unfortunately, we could not do that. I am going to leave it at this and discuss with you some of the factors that determine the markup. The number of competitors and the intensity of competition, size, cost and intensity of the project, the type of the project whether building, infrastructure projects or whatever it is, duration of the project, location of the project, season in which the work is done, degree of hazard and difficulty associated with the project name of the owner, consultant, designer and the time available for bid preparation. Why the name of the owner, consultant and designers is important is perhaps coming from the fact that at the end of it a bidder may look at who the owner is. There may be a reason for this bidder to associate with that owner for the first time or choose not to associate with that owner at a given percentage of markup and so on. So, that is why bidder looks at some of these things apart from a lot of other things like we will see from this slide that is labor availability and productivity in the given area, percentage of the work which has to be subcontracted and the bids of the subcontractors, we will talk about it subsequently in this lecture today, insurance cost and fringe benefits, availability of supervisory talent, methods of performing the work, uncertainty in estimate and historic profit current and forecast economic conditions and the contractors risk attitudes. From this, it is several factors listed here allude to it, but what is not explicitly stated and perhaps I should make it clear, the markup would also depend on what is the kind of business that the contractor or the bidder has at hand with him. If the bidder looks at his projects available with him at a particular point in time, and finds that all of them are near completion and within the next few months there will be no projects to do and all the manpower from the bidder's side will become idle. And in order to keep that manpower with the company, the bidder might choose to work on a project at a lower markup. Contrary to this, there could be a situation where the bidder would say that my hands are full and I really do not want to bid for this project, but if for some reason I must bid for that project, then I would be interested to do that project only if the profit margins are really very good. The offer is so good that I cannot refuse it. So, in that case, the bidder will quote a higher markup and if we get the job, well and good, do not get it, well and good. So, basically one must remember that if the markup becomes high, the bid price becomes high and if the bid price as it becomes higher, the probability of winning that particular bid, particularly if it is only a cost bid based on the cost alone, then the probability of winning that bid goes down. So, in fact, that is one of the theories that we have, one of the subjects that we could study as far as construction management is concerned is the application of game theory and such probability models for bidding processes under this kind of a uncertain environment where there is a lot of risk and uncertainty 
as is the case of construction projects. So that is something which we could not really unfortunately do. Let me now try to spend some time and go over some overhead expenses more explicitly because they have to be accounted for as a part of the markup. Several expenses incurred at the headquarters cannot be directly traced to any particular project and accordingly and therefore are charged from running projects on a pro rata basis. So, if a large project is there, it contributes a larger share to overheads. If it is a small project, it contributes a smaller share, but all the projects running have to contribute to keep the company going as far as the overheads are concerned, as far as certain expenses incurred at the headquarters are concerned. Such expenses include research and development, publicity and advertisement, the cost of unsuccessful bids that necessarily need to be distributed over other projects obviously, recruitment of personnel and the salaries of security personnel at the head office and so on and so forth. So, there are several of these expenses which are incurred which are obviously not debitable to any particular project and therefore should be coming from a general pool. The general overheads as they are called for a construction company could vary between 2 to 3 percent of the contract value depending on the factors such as the turnover, staff strength, nature of expenses incurred at head office and the number of projects in hand. So, depending on how big the company is, what is the kind of company culture, what is the kind of compliance that the company has, what is the kind of perks that the company gives to its employees, the overheads for that particular company could be varying. And now coming to provisions for contingency which is risk and uncertainty. We must remember that construction projects are a risky proposition full of uncertainties and risks. In spite of different details known at the tendering stage, there are uncertainties and risks pertaining to timely completion, budget escalation, site conditions, soil characteristics, labor and material availability and so on. In order to safeguard against these eventualities, contractors have to keep certain contingency provisions which have to be part of a markup kind of a pool. Indeed, the higher the uncertainties involved in the project at the time of tendering, the higher is the provision for contingency. In fact, it is relevant here to mention that if the contract is drawn up in a manner where the uncertainty and risks are more fairly shared and there is a greater protection which is afforded to the contractor, the contingencies which are indicated to be higher here can be actually brought down. So, moving on, let us talk a little bit about subcontracting in the construction industry. Given the multidisciplinary nature of construction projects, it is difficult for any contractor to maintain an in-house expertise of all the skills, equipment, etc. that may be required to complete a project. This gives rise to the possibility and need for forming joint ventures and or subcontracting in the construction sector. Companies may have a firm alliance with partners or an alliance can or is forged for a particular project. What this slide basically tells us is that a company may not be able to have the expertise in all the areas which are required to handle or execute a large construction project. Now, given that, what are the options? The options are that if I have an expertise in these areas which are whatever these areas are and there is a small area where I do not have the expertise or this company does not have the expertise. So, the options are to identify a company which has these expertise and have a permanent relationship or a permanent alliance with this company that okay, whenever we bid for the project which requires this expertise, you will be our permanent partner. The other option is that Obviously, there will be other companies which will have a similar expertise and depending on my choice and the project, its location and so on, I am free to choose whether I take this company or this company or this company to be my partner as far as that project is concerned. So, that is what is being said here that companies may have a firm alliance with partners that is this company is more or less a part of our bidding team as far as one option is concerned. In the other option is that there is no team which is formed here and we are talking essentially of a more open system where once the project is awarded to this company, it chooses from 
the different people available to be able to carry out that particular job. An example in point would be that if the job is predominantly a civil engineering job with a small amount of electrical works involved, how does the contractor go about doing it? A civil contractor does not have the expertise to carry out electrical works. So that is the kind of example that we can have here. Now as far as joint ventures are concerned, depending on the relative values of different jobs involved, civil and electrical, civil and equipment, equipment and controls, whatever it is, companies having expertise in two or three or whatever areas, they come together, form a joint venture and bid for that project together. As far as that process is concerned, the clients at times when they invite tenders, they clearly lay down a specification or a requirement that you please declare your partners up front. Sometimes they say that well, you will be awarded the job and at a later date you can find a subcontractor, but that subcontractor has to be usually approved by the client and only then you can actually outsource any amount of work to that subcontractor. Now if we understand this part of subcontracting construction industry, we must understand that we should not have too many subcontractors. We should try to engage for example a single agency for form work, reinforcement work and concrete works. Because more the number of subcontractors, the more difficult it becomes to manage the site. Appropriate registrations of subcontractors must be ensured. Appropriate registrations would include registrations with statutory bodies like income tax or the labor office, the safety office and so on and so forth. Pre-qualification norms are complied with. Ensure that the subcontractors comply with all statutory requirements. The main contractor continues to have all the responsibility for acts of omission and commission of the subcontractors. So basically the relationship is the client has identified a contractor. Now, even though the client has identified the contractor and the contractor is permitted to identify a subcontractor, finally the client would look at only the contractor as the main contractor and for whatever acts of omission and commission that the subcontractor may do, the contractor or the main contractor has to take full responsibility. And therefore, as I mentioned before, a list of subcontractors for different items of work, for the different specialized items of work, maybe it is welding, maybe it is erection of equipment, maybe it is providing form work, whatever it is, the client may ask for a list of possible partners that a particular contractor may like to engage as far as a particular project is concerned. Why are the works subcontracted? To be able to do the job economically, to avoid legal hurdles, there are some issues which get avoided if you work through subcontractors, to avoid a large workforce, to utilize the expertise of specialized agencies, to honor contractual commitments, nominated subcontractors, for a speedy mobilization, to complete the job within the time frame and quality standards with optimum cost with utmost safety. I could give you examples how contractual commitments or nominated subcontractor the system could be seen. For example, we may have a system that if a particular company is doing the civil works, so there will be some concrete plants which may be not owned by this company, but we may have an arrangement with those concrete ready mix plants that okay, if we are doing this job, the concrete will be bought from a particular plant. Those plants in turn or this company for example may have a certain standing arrangement with certain cement manufacturers or chemical admixture manufacturers. It helps in the long run perhaps to have some working relationships or standing arrangements with these companies because then issues such as trade secrets and so on are taken care of more easily than if we were working on a purely case to case basis. So cement manufacturer is not a part of the contract but is a partner as far as the civil contractor is concerned. As far as subcontractor selection is concerned, we must look at past experience, mobilization capacity in terms of available human and technical resources, 
financial capacity, quality of the work executed in the past, the price that is quoted, the history as subcontractor with the client, and appropriate registrations. So these are some of the qualities which the contractor should look at when trying to identify a subcontractor. So in a manner of speaking, the exercise that the client carries out in identifying the contractor is actually similar to the exercise that the contractor should carry out when identifying subcontractors, except that the contractor perhaps has a lot more leeway in selecting subcontractors than most of the time is available to the clients. Coming to the next issue which I would have wished to cover is computer applications in construction management. Now computers and information technology has swamped the world to the extent that there is hardly an area where we do not use computers and surely construction management is also an area where there are lots of computer applications and things have become a lot easier and a lot more streamlined because of these applications. As far as scheduling and planning is concerned, for example, there is a whole lot of softwares which are available for assisting an engineer as far as scheduling and planning of activities is concerned. Similarly, inventory management including equipment management has become a lot easier because of the developments in the computers and the information technology. The sites would know where a particular equipment is idling, when would it be used, would it make sense to schedule a particular activity now and just borrow that equipment from there and so on and so forth. Similarly, record keeping and archival has become a lot easier which is such an integral part and such an important part as far as carrying out construction activities is concerned. Quality control has become a lot easier because a lot of data can be stored, retrieved and analyzed for whatever purpose it is required. Similarly, financial control and management has become a lot easier, labor and personal management have become easier and there are so many other examples which we can cite as far as computer applications are concerned. And I would leave you to find out some of the most commonly used softwares available in the market and commercially used by companies as far as construction industry is concerned. Now coming to an entirely different and a very important part of construction management is concerns with reading a corporate financial statement and evaluating financial strength of companies. Now this slide here tells you three statements, the balance sheet, the income and expenditure statement and cash flow statement. I would have wished that we could spend some more time discussing this, but given the constraints, let me just quickly tell you in two lines what they are. A balance sheet is a snapshot or a statement of assets and liabilities on a given date. It is the position of assets and liabilities at a given point in time. Income and expenditure statement on the other hand is the flow of income and expenditure statement over a period of time. This can be prepared on a cash basis or accrual basis. The cash flow statement will be different from the former which is the income and expenditure statement. If it is prepared on the accrual basis else it will be the same as the income and expenditure statement. See what we are trying to understand here is the following. We have seen in our discussion that over a period of time there are certain expenditures that the company incurs and there are certain inflows and they may happen at different points in time. How do we prepare the company's accounts in a manner that there may be several sites that are operating and at each site certain expenditures are being incurred certain running account bills are being generated and received. So as far as the company is concerned, it is important that the company has some idea as to what is going on. Now this exercise is happening all the time. This happens in January, it happens in February, some bills come in March, some bills go, some bills come in April, payments are made in different points of time and so on and so forth. So now a balance sheet gives us the snapshot of the situation in terms of assets and liabilities and we are going to talk about what assets and liabilities are. It gives a statement on the assets and liabilities as if it was a photograph. So we take a snapshot and say that well on this given date what is the position as far as assets and liabilities is concerned. Whereas the income expenditure statement says that okay over a period of time whether it is 
1st April to 31st March of the next year or is it 1st January to 31st December of a particular year? Whatever window we may choose, we may choose 12 months, we may choose 6 months, we may choose a quarter. During that period, what is the net and what is the flow of funds in terms of inflow and outflow? Now, coming to this cash basis and accrual basis, that is a more technical issue. Suppose there was a bank deposit for 100 rupees at the rate of 10 percent and we keep it for 3 years. So, this 100 rupees would grow to 110 in the first year and 121 in the next year and whatever it grows to in the third year. Now, when it matures, it gives me a certain amount of money which will have a certain interest component. Now, whether this interest component should be charged only at the end or should we say that well, even at the end of one year, we have had an interest income of 10 rupees. Now, that is the kind of difference which we have in terms of cash systems and accrual systems. If we take this 10 outside every year, in this case we take out 10, in this case we take out 11 and the third year we will take out something else, then it is a more distributed statement of incomes which is accruing, but it is not showing in our cash because this 110 is not being deposited or is not getting transferred to the account, but it is accruing. So, that is what you have to understand as the difference between cash and accrual. We will not hold you responsible to cash and accrual kind of discussion as far as the exam is concerned, but yes, you must understand that there is a difference between cash and accrual and accounts can be prepared on either of the basis. So, some accounts kind of a class we will probably discuss which is a more prevalent system now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these systems, but that is a different discussion and we could not get into this discussion as far as this course is concerned. Coming to a brief discussion as far as assets are concerned and then we will talk about liabilities. Assets are items of value owned by the company either as cash or otherwise which is convertible to money and assets are of two types, fixed and current assets and fixed assets can be divided into two types, tangible and intangible. Tangible assets are land, plant and machinery, buildings and so on and so forth. Intangible assets would include patents, copyrights, goodwill, there is no way you can assign a certain value to these assets. As far as current assets are concerned, these are assets of short duration which would be debtors, cash and bank balances, stock and so on. One term that is often used in the context of assets is the liquidity of assets. Now, the liquidity of assets basically refers to how easily or with what ease can a particular asset be converted to cash. So, obviously, cash is most liquid, then we could have bank deposits, then we could go to term deposits. Land is one of those assets which has a very low level of liquidity because it takes a longer time to convert land to cash. There is the question of liquidity of assets, but of course, whether liquidity is low or high, the assets will remain as far as assets are concerned. Similarly, if we come to liabilities, this is basically a list of items that the company owes to others and it may be owed to the owners, shareholders or any financial institution. As far as liabilities are concerned, accountants and bookkeepers talk of long term liabilities and current liabilities. Long term liabilities would be bonds, loans, mortgages, current liabilities could be short term accounts, taxes payable, accrued expenses and so on and usually the benchmark period is one year to differentiate between long term and short term liability. Now, when it comes to legal provisions and acts applicable to construction, we did discuss a few things as far as construction law is concerned, but there is this whole list of different acts which are relevant as far as construction industry is concerned. The Workman Compensation Act, the Payment of Gratuity Act, the Employees PF and Miscellaneous Provisions Act, Maternity Benefits Act, Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act, Minimum Wages Act and so on. We would have liked to probably spend a little bit of time on some of these and the provisions of these acts as far as construction industry is concerned. Especially important is the Building and Other Construction Workers and CES Acts which have been enacted recently, recently means in about 1996 as far as India is concerned. This act defines the normal working day, the wage conditions, 
the requirement for maintenance of registers and records, prohibition of employment with people having disabilities, especially when it comes to jobs which require different levels of risk and hazards, safety issues including accident reporting and investigation, the facilities to be provided at site, for example, crashes for children, canteens, drinking water and so on. Then there is a CES Act which has made it mandatory for a certain kind of construction activity. Then there is a CES Act according to which certain kinds of construction activity have to necessarily deposit a certain amount of money, it is a certain percentage of the total cost of project with the state which will be used by the state developed facilities which are useful to construction workers. So with this we more or less come to a close to what I had in the wish list and before I close the discussion I must share with you once again the Hammurabi tablet. If a builder constructed a house but did not make his work strong with the result that the house which he built collapsed and so caused the death of the owner of the house, the builder shall be put to death. One must remember in this day and age that we may not practice the Hammurabi tablet, but the sense of responsibility towards safety and quality of workmanship is something which cannot be overemphasized. So if I could leave you with this particular message as far as this course is concerned, I think part of the idea of having this discussion over 40 lectures would have been served. And I must also share with you the rules that have been formulated by the ASC, that is the American Society of Civil Engineers in 1977 which are still effective. The ethical rules in the United States are updated at intervals of few years to ensure that they reflect the changing social and economic situations and the fundamental principles are that the engineers will uphold and advance the integrity, honor and dignity of the profession by using their knowledge and skill for the enhancement of human welfare, being honest, impartial and serving with fidelity the public, their employers and clients, striving to increase the competence and prestige of the engineering profession and supporting the professional and technical societies of their disciplines. And this is enforced by the fundamental canons. Engineers shall hold paramount the safety and welfare of the public in the performance of their professional duties. Engineers shall perform services only in the area of their competence. Engineers shall issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. And engineers shall act in professional matters for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees and shall avoid conflict of interest. Continuing, engineers shall build their professional reputation on the merit of their services and shall not compete unfairly with others. Engineers shall act in such a manner as to uphold and enhance the honor, integrity and dignity of the engineering profession and engineers shall continue their professional development throughout their careers and shall provide opportunities for the professional development of those engineers under their supervision. So this is coming from the ASC and I hold all of you to these standards that we must practice a certain level of ethics, a certain level of professionalism when we practice or when we actually carry out our jobs. We must remember that as far as doctors are concerned, there is the Hippocrates oath which all doctors are bound to. That is they are bound to follow the Hippocrates oath when they are practicing medicine as a profession and therefore we have to have a similar code of conduct almost as far as engineers are concerned and what I have read out here in the last couple of slides is perhaps a succinct summary of what all engineers should strive to do. And with this we come to an end of the discussion as far as our course on principles of construction management is concerned and before I bid you goodbye I would like to introduce the team that worked with me here in this institute. Bera Prasanna Kumar is a PhD student, Sahil Garg is a PhD student and Aastha and Avantika are working on projects with me here. Bera Prasanna Kumar was of course the TA who helped coordinate the forum and talk to you several times as far as the discussion is concerned and I am not sure if the others were directly part of the forum but they were definitely part of the team that put together certain presentations, helped me put the referencing together and so on. I acknowledge the support from all these people and of course the people in the studios who helped all the recordings and editing and so on and so forth. So it has been a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you.